tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank you very much for having me here. It's been a wonderful time, a, a wonderful reunion, a wonderful blessing. And thank you so much for honoring me by giving me this opportunity. So thank you so very much. Uh, spit is gross. You know that. I know that. Nobody likes spit. And the one thing we dislike about spit mostly is somebody else's spit. Because we have essentially accepted your own spit. In fact, all of you produce about one to two liters of spit. That could be about maybe a gallon a day of spit that you all produce. And you're all pretty comfortable with that. You know, none of you right now are sitting there, I can't stand myself. How do I live with all this spit in my life? And so you find spit gross, but you all have it. I have it, you have it, we all deal with a large amount of split, spit. And when you think about spit, it's just kind of produced in our glands. You got some on your cheeks, some in the front of your mouth, and it secretes this ooze, this slimy substance, and it's made out of water and some other type of chemicals, and it gives it a wonderful consistency to help your food to go down, it's a good thing, but you all agree with me, you all find spit gross. Well, spit's kind of like sin. A lot of times, you find sin disgusting. It's gross, it's sickening. And I can guarantee you that you have it. You have sin. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you have all kind of come to grips with your own sin. You're kind of used to it. It's part of your life. But I've discovered that people can kind of become accustomed to their own sin. But you know what they really find disgusting? Somebody else's sin. Their sin. Now, they don't like it. They need to overcome it. They need to stop it. And it's something they're struggling with. But your sin, now that's an issue. How could you do that? That is disgusting and sick. We love judging other people's sins much more than looking at our own sins. Now, in our context this afternoon, look at Luke chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. And this story that Jesus told, tells, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God. I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We have always preached this parable as a prayer parable. We have preached it like Jesus is telling a parable about prayer. It's not about prayer. This is not about prayer. This is about false concepts of righteousness. 
This is what he's trying to teach them. What is our view of righteousness? A lot of times it's easy for us to look at ourselves and say, I'm righteous. I'm doing the best I can. And give all that grace to ourselves. But then when we look at others, it's easy us to judge them. They may have this struggle, and we look at that struggle and think, oh, that's terrible. But then we look at our own struggles and we give ourselves all the mercy. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We give ourselves the excuses. It's just something we're dealing with. But them, now that's a sinner. We all have darkness in our lives. We all have sin. But the beauty of our culture today is that we can get so occupied keeping ourselves entertained that we don't have to really look at our own sense of righteousness. We can get on our cell phones, we can look at TV, we can get on the internet, we can watch movies. We can keep ourselves so preoccupied that we never reflect on who we are because we'd rather reflect on who somebody else is. We'd rather point the finger than to look at ourselves. And so Jesus deals with this. We keep distracted. Jesus says, look at your own righteousness. Look at Luke 18, 10 to 12. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other their men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. This is not even a good humble brag. You know on Facebook, you have people who humble brag. We have people on Facebook, like ourselves, who humble brag. And it's, you know, so glad that I got to serve the homeless today. You know, all praise goes to God as I tell you all about what I did. You know, this is not even a good humble brag. Everybody sees through this. Now imagine you in the temple, and here's this guy who gets up and says, Lord, I thank ye that I am not like. And you could almost be like the extortioner, and then that tax collector, and then he goes on. And now it's one thing to point out everybody else, but imagine if this happened at church here. What would you do? How would you respond? I'm so thankful that I give 10% of all that I work for. I visit the widows and the orphans, unlike the rest of you all. A lot of times we think this is in the Bible story, but have you ever heard a prayer like this? I was talking to a preacher, and he says, there's one guy would pray the announcements. Lord, help us come back at five. <laughs> this guy's not even doing the announcements. This guy's just getting up, bragging to everybody, and even calling people out. He doesn't understand righteousness. Because he has created a short list. This is where the beauty of being legalistic comes in. Being legalistic is a great joy for those who are legalistic. You know why? Because a legalist creates a list, and it's a short list. And when you're a legalist, and you get to define what the list looks like, and then you measure yourself up to that list, it's a great place to be. Well, I think I'm going to include five things, and so I have done these five things. I give well, you know, I visit pretty well. Okay, but Jesus says the Pharisees in Luke chapter 16, 14, and 18 were lovers of money. Oh, he didn't mention that. He didn't talk about that. He may be giving, but he's greedy. And maybe he's in the position that 10% may be a joke. He could be given 20, 30. 
but he's greedy in his heart. Now, he doesn't mention that. A legalist define what righteousness looks like. Jesus says, that's not how we define it. So I was going to bring this glass of spit in with me, but I thought nobody really needed to see that after they ate. And sometimes that doesn't go that well because you would have looked at my spit and you would have found that really disgusting. And then you'd be like, we just ate. Come on, Matthew, show some class. And we didn't want that to happen. Now imagine, though, if I had a cup of spit. A cup of spit. So look, let's look at our spit picture at least. All right, do something You make it happen. And so, so imagine I had a cup of spit. And I said to you, would you like to drink my spit? Every one of you would be like, I'm not going to drink that spit. That's disgusting. But it's just my spit. In fact, I don't find my spit that bad. I run sometimes. And in Colorado, it gets windy, and I'll be running, and I'll spit, and you never know where it's going to land. You know what I mean. And I'll be running, and sometimes it's on your leg, sometimes it's on your arm. You know, you always worried if someone's passing, you took the turn, and you spit, and you think, oh, no, what's going to happen? You always get scared. But it's just my spit, but you won't touch it. One of the most degrading things in our society is spitting on somebody else. Because we like to accept our sense of spit, our sin, but your sins. Now that's sick. We don't really look at who we really are. This is the nature of self-righteous judgment. Your stuff is just wrong. My stuff, I'm working on. Now, the tax collector, if he comes in Luke chapter 18, verse 13 to 14, look at his approach, though. This is true righteousness. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will will be exalted. Now look at his attitude. He does four things. First of all, he beats his breast. He doesn't even look up. He admits that he's a sinner and he's afar off. He does all these things because he comes to the realization, Lord, I need mercy. Do you notice the difference in the attitudes? The Pharisee is saying, mercy, I may have mercy, but I don't need mercy. I'm already perfect for who I am. Jesus says, but you've got a spit problem too. you just got to confess it. The tax collector, on the other hand, he looks up at it and says, i got a spit problem. And my only solution is to plead for mercy. Not to judge the other person. Not to feel more self-righteous than other people. Not to look at them and say, they got the issue, but I'm doing okay. We all got spit. Jesus says, you got to confess that you all have a spit problem. You got to admit it. And God will do something about it. Because when you think about Jesus Christ... What did they do to Jesus? As he was going to the cross, they spit upon him. That is the act of degrading him. Creation spit on the creator. Creation spit on the creator. He who is holy, sinful, Men and women spit on him. Now, you know how disgusting it is spit is. You know, when I said, would anybody drink my spit? All of you were like, no. I'm glad you didn't bring that in. Now, imagine if you in this room, as a sermon illustration, I said, we're going to have somebody come up here, and this whole congregation is going to spit on 
this person? What would you want to do? You would go home and bathe yourself, shower yourself, go to Bathworks or something like that, some girly shop. <laughs> and you'd still feel dirty, wouldn't you? Jesus Christ was spit on, but he also took the sins of mankind as disgusting as it feels in your heart of thinking about everybody spitting on you. Ramp that up and you get even a small morsel of the truth. All of humanity's sins were on Jesus Christ. He was bathed in sin. He took upon the sins of humanity all the disgusting, despicable wickedness of this world on himself. How filthy and dirty would you feel if you had all the sins of the world on you? He was willing to be degraded, spit upon. And he says, I will take the sins of the world. You spit on me. Your sins will become my sins. And I will be made dirty so that you could become clean. When you realize what Jesus has done for all of us, we realize the sacrifice he made. But I've discovered something. There's a way to overcome the spit problem. Because we all have it. And I've learned the secret of overcoming spit. And you have found it too. Because some many years ago, I found a nice little bride part of this congregation when I showed up as the youth intern. And though I like to say I get judged everywhere I go now, because people will always ask me, where did you meet your wife? I said, oh, I was doing an internship at a church. And they always look at me and they leer at me like, you were dating a high school girl? <laughs> and I always have to stop them and be like, she graduated from college. She graduated from college. Because they always go there, judgmental people. But I found myself, nice little bride, and when we got married, the, well, actually my brother-in-law, said, you may kiss your bride. You know what kissing is, everybody? Swapping spit. <laughs> now that I've ruined that for you, but that's what it is. And why do you do it? You have, have you ever kissed somebody you hate? You kiss people because you love them. The only way to overcome the spit issue is by love. Love. What is so amazing is we don't stand back like the Pharisee and judge. We, through love, say, let me help you with this. Let me be part of you overcoming your stuff. We don't sit back and judge by the position of self-righteousness that I'm better than you. We come in the position of fellow spit sharers and say, let's do this together. Jesus Christ modeled that. I will come to earth and join with you. And why did he come? Because of love. I share with you this gross sermon. <laughs> but I think you see the point. Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to come and do something about it. The Pharisee only wanted to judge. The tax collector pleaded for mercy. Jesus says, I can solve it. And you have the opportunity this afternoon if you will believe, confess, repent, be baptized for the remission of your sins, rise up over that water to newness of life. Or maybe if you have wandered away and you are dealing with your spit problem, your sin problem, 
you have an opportunity to make that right as we stand and sing the imitation song. All right.